so excited to be here and part of Davos Worldwide. Um, we are going to be speaking about climate and future solutions in the climate space. Um, in fact, we are hosting an event, PDIE and Sublime Communications on September 15th that we would invite many of you to be a part of uh, in September. Uh, feel free to reach out at any time, but uh, without further ado, I want to turn over to Christian Schmitz who will be leading this panel. Uh, and Christian is a Earthshot Prize nom. He has made two World um, Earthshot Prize winning nominations. And so I would like to turn over to you, Christian. And it's very late where he is, by the way, he's in Japan. Yeah, so um, I, I would say the same like Anand, good middle of the night to everybody who is listening. Uh, it's, yeah, it's three o'clock here in Japan, Tokyo. Um, I'm German, uh, same as Jörg, who is uh, sitting in Berlin right now. And we have Luke, uh, who is also in the US, who hopefully can switch on his video soon. Great to have you, Luke. Um, <clears throat> just a, a quick introduction. PDIE stands for Purpose Driven Innovation Ecosystem. Uh, I'm the founder of the PDIE group, and we uh, co-create a better tomorrow by finding and scaling the most impactful and sustainable solutions uh, from local to global markets. And uh, we are working with a couple of different initiatives. And at the moment, uh, here in Japan, uh, we are also running the climate launch pad, uh, which is going to the idea stage. So we are we are working with people who can come with their ideas uh, and scale their ideas to global business impact. The Earthshot Prize, uh, which uh, Nicole just mentioned, this is uh, called the most prestigious environmental award on the planet, which has been inaugurated by Prince William and Sir David Attenborough in 2020 at the World Economic Forum. There are five different uh, categories, fix the climate, clean our air, protect and restore nature, build a waste-free world, and um, yeah, what, what was the fifth one? Uh, we, we have won uh, the Earthshot Prize in the category uh, fix the climate uh, twice now in, in the first and in the second year. Uh, one time with Enapta, which uh, was a company uh, focusing on hydrogen, on AEM electrolyzers and scaling these electrolyzers to mass scale. Uh, in the second year, it was a solution for uh, mineralizing uh, CO2 in peridotite, a company from Oman. So a big surprise also for us but a highly scalable solution to get uh, the these carbon, which is captured from industrial carbon capture uh, and put it back into the ground, basically. So uh, that's uh, a little bit of, of an introduction about PDIE. And uh, I give to, to Jörg, so that Jörg also introduces himself and uh, then we go to Luke. Well, not much about myself. Uh, I'm a co-founder of PDIE and I've worked in the area of uh, sustainability for uh, quite a while. I'm involved uh, in a think tank that some of you may know uh, called Club of Rome, which has been active in the field of uh, sustainability since the late 60s and became known for its seminal report called Limits to Growth, talking about issues that are very um, prominent today, um, including climate change and uh, other global challenges. And uh, Christian and I are 
uh, trying to drive uh, the solutions uh, to some of these challenges. And uh, I guess most of you are here because you'd like to hear more about uh, the, the Earthshot Prize as well as some of the solutions that PDIE uh, have nominated. And since uh, Luke uh, is one of the nominees, um, uh, I'm handing over to him to e elaborate a bit about his approach and his solution. And uh, uh, as one example of the companies we have nominated uh, for the Earthshot Prize. With you all, thanks for, um, I'm in a, in a mini van. My family and I are traveling across the Midwest right now to go have the children see grandpa and grandma in Wisconsin. Um, so I hope you can hear me okay. My internet is, is sound, but anyway. Um, so I'm Luke. I'm a material scientist. I, um, I'm an accidental entrepreneur. I was, as a chemistry professor, I was interested in looking into this, this problem that we have in the world, which is we get a lot of our materials, trillion, actually more than a trillion dollars per year worth of materials that we use in our everyday lives for our clothes, for our shoes, not just the packaging for our food but clothes and shoes and, and furniture and car interiors all come from plastic, which comes from oil. And of course there's, there's issues with plastics in terms of the fossil resources that are used to produce them. And of course, microplastic and toxicity and, and sort of externalities on the end of life. And as a chemist, what I realized really quickly is Petrochemical refineries are really only good at churning crude oil and therms of natural gas into plastic. And they and those those same that that infrastructure, there's more than a hundred trillion in in infrastructure around the world that's really good at making plastics, but it has no idea what to do with your old shoes and your old clothes and car interiors and things like that. And so I started thinking about what would be a better system to make trillions of dollars of materials. So humans around the world could have a low carbon, non-toxic circular economy for materials. And um, well, as a chemist, I started recognizing that actually the, the answer wasn't just technical, it was financial, um, that, that technology would need to scale. And so um, long story short, I started filtering the world of technology and developing my own technologies and, and settled on the idea that Basically, if you could make shoes like this out of only plants, only plants, no petrochemicals, no plastics, no petrochemical additives, then the beautiful thing is if you could get recipes that could be made from the most abundant nutrient producing system on the planet, which is photosynthesis and plants, and if you could get uh, materials of a variety of materials, leather-like materials, textiles, foams, the soles of shoes, if you could get those materials to be only plants and nutrients and things from soil, then you would have a chance of both low carbon and non-toxicity toxicity and circularity all at the same time. And so um, I'm happy to report it's possible. Uh, you can buy these products, um, the, begin, the first products you can, you can buy now, shoes um, and clothes with Ralph. So Unless Collective and Allbirds and Camper but soon other big, large shoe brands. Um, you know, we're working with companies like BMW on car interiors, uh, Ralph Lauren and many, many other fashion brands on scaling up really a new production system for materials that uses the byproducts and the co-products of food in order to make, uh, it's a platform approach to make materials that then when at the end of your life, or even with it post-industrial um, sort of, when you have waste from making shoes, those shoes and those parts for shoes aren't toxic. They're natural, kind of like a tree is natural. And you can grind up a tree and give it back to nature and you can grind up, grind up these materials and get them back to nature. So that's, that's a little bit about NFW, natural fiber welding and myself. And I should pause here and I, I don't want to like, monopolize the time there's there's lots more i could I, I would talk to you as christian knows we we've, we've had conversations where the conversation keeps going so i can keep going but i'm, I'm going to pause and say thank you for letting me share 
Well, first of all, all hats off to what you're doing. It's absolutely amazing. And Luke, I had the pleasure of meeting you briefly last year at the World Economic Forum um, and was beyond impressed by the advances that you're making. And I think the, the main focus really I, that I wanna get into, because I think there are so many family offices listening and um, people who want to invest in the space and want to really understand criteria for investment. Um, how, you know, Christian, it's absolutely amazing that you've managed with thousands and thousands of different companies and solutions coming into the Earthshot Prize as submissions. How on earth do you sift through and, and you know, you've managed to nominate two of the winners and, and Luke, again, to be a winner of this esteemed prize is such an incredible accomplishment. But, you know, I think as investors, what is that lens? How do you look at things? How do you evaluate? And um, then we'll get into some other areas. Great. Yeah, so <clears throat> uh, first of all, I mean, uh, <clears throat> it's all about having a, a great team. And um, <clears throat> we are very fortunate to have uh, people all around the world uh, who are uh, PDIE ambassadors, who are screening different markets and looking at different solutions. <clears throat> and then uh, when we get to see these solutions, uh, it's not enough to just uh, superficially screen it, but uh, we, we need to dig deep. Uh, we need to build relationships uh, with the founders of each of these companies. And <clears throat> we also have a holistic approach. So uh, we don't want to nominate or we don't want to go with any solutions uh, which actually solve one problem. But on the other hand, uh, it actually creates some other externality. So uh, something like what, what Luke is doing is really a, a kind of a perfect example of, uh, I mean, we, we don't know yet where, where it will be going, but... Uh, we hope that uh, NFW uh, could be a finalist uh, for this this year. The finalists will be actually announced uh, in the middle of September when when we also have our event. So a little bit after our event, uh, the the finalists will be announced. <clears throat> so we are very thrilled uh, to to hear about this. And um, yeah, so it's 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 really a combination of looking at at the solution and then uh, many of these solutions are highly technical and nobody can know everything in every kind of discipline uh, so what what we also have is we have a, a science and technology advisory board and our uh, Earthshot Prize uh, coordinator Hannah Willis uh, she also has a science background and uh, she has developed a meticulous method to uh, put things down and to sort it out. And then uh, we have um, a kind of a hierarchical selection criteria. And within the selection criteria, uh, what is it? There's a technology, but there's also the team, uh, the founding team. And we have to look for example, into the team, is this a diverse team? And uh, how, how is the founder, can, can the founder be flexible sometimes to, to change the direction if necessary? Is he really re passionate about his, his vision? And is this what, what they're doing? Is it also scalable? And would the solution imply some social uh, additional impacts? So yeah, it, it's it's a highly complex task, and I um, 
I couldn't maybe um, summarize it here in, in a very uh, concise way, uh, but uh, Jörg, uh, who has been uh, a long time in the space as well, uh, he, he knows a lot about uh, how to actually uh, pick and choose uh, the right solutions. Um, so maybe uh, we can we can also uh, give it to Jörg again. Well, maybe just to add a few thoughts. I mean, you know, many, many uh, people in the audience uh, have probably looked at various enterprises and uh, there's also always a bit of luck, you know, being at the right place at the right time. So I would say it's a mix of uh, a met meticulous approach, uh, uh, the hard facts on, on the one hand, which are well known, but uh, as uh, most of you already uh, also know, it's, it's also kind of having the right instinct, what solution may be the right fit for investors or in, in our case for the Earthshot Prize uh, judges. So, and, and they're particularly interested in systemic solutions, as Christian said, when he talks about uh, externalities, um, I would say it's it's really about uh, uh, making sure that uh, systemically speaking, there will be positive ripple effects. Uh, so it's not just about uh, thinking about solutions and their effects in the short term, but how can solutions actually change markets or create new markets? Um, and uh, Luke with his uh, company is a very good example. Um, so if you can replace plastics with plant-based products, then uh, the impact can be massive. I think uh, microplastic and plastic in general um, is, is a huge problem um, in, in oceans, uh, in, in, in our drinking water, in developing countries. So if we can address and solve this problem um, and uh, not only make shoes and clothes recyclable and uh, take a more circular approach, but, uh, but basically can uh, um, address this problem in a, in a different way, then uh, a lot of problems will be addressed at the same time. So it's really about taking a more systemic approach towards solving problems. But maybe Luke from his experience can also add a few more thoughts in, in this respect. So, um, yeah, I, I'll, I'll start with the luck piece. You know, I'm, I'm, I was a chemist that I guess had a particular access to information and a mindset at the right time in history. Um, you know, we haven't had plastics forever, of course. We, we sort of the, in the modern world, sometimes people think, oh, plastics have been around a while. Well, 80 years, maybe something like that. Um, and plastics are kind of an accident. From the, from the pursuit of energy and fossil resources for fuel, the plastic industry is sort of So we're at this point in history where a chemist sort of said, you know what, we need to, if we're gonna stay within planetary boundaries, if we're gonna avoid toxicity, if we're gonna avoid carbon footprints that are through the roof, if we're gonna avoid the negative externalities of end of life of, of many different kinds of products, then we gotta go back to nature. And the fortunate thing is nature's at very large scale. Um, you know, there's so much food produced in the world each year that humans are feeding it to cars. Um, and so that was like one way of thinking is what would be a production source that would be at least as big, if not bigger than the, the fossil resource industry. And, and that's basically regenerative agriculture solutions. And then you, you put that and combine that with automation. So there's a lot of automation efficiency advancements that have happened in the world in the last couple of decades. And it allowed me to, thinking as a chemist with an economics filter, think about technologies that would intrinsically sort of check three major boxes. Number one, scale. Number two, cost point. And number three, ultimate sustainability. And then um, what I was left with was, could I actually get technical solutions that could perform well enough for BMW, perform well enough for Allbirds or Ralph Lauren or these different huge brands in the world that use a lot of different synthetic materials. Um, and so for the past six years, our company, seven years, I guess now, um, our company has been working really hard at establishing and proving 
product market fit. And then in the last couple of weeks, actually, just we've been able to um, prove, for example, to BMW that our materials are automotive worthy and it allows us to be now negotiating large scale contracting um, with brands who basically, maybe one of the best things I could direct people to in terms of when they think about technology and they think about how does product market fit work, then it's, it's actually talk to customers. So there's a really nice article online by the BMW iVentures team that says there are four buckets you need to check. You need to check sustainability, cost, scale, and performance. And we sort of started with an approach that made sure that scale and cost and sustainability were going to be checked. And then the product market fit question was, was performance. And um, well, it's, it's a wonderful time in history for us. We've, we've achieved those performance thresholds, which allows us to then talk about contracting with, with really large companies and, and in ways where they don't have to pay giant premiums in order to adopt materials that um, don't have the negative externalities. So um, you kind of want to look for those elements, unit economics and, and how unit economics will scale and then does the proposed solution actually deliver the performance that customers need? And you get that information by talking to customers and um, you know, happy to talk more too about where you can find info. There's a lot of customers out there that, that are sharing their needs. They're, they're on their ESG pages. Like we're looking for lower carbon footprints. We're looking for things that um, allow us to do more recycling. And, um, and then it comes down to the hard work of how do you deliver that with an infrastructure that can scale? For a minute, I thought I lost you all. Um, I think all this is all incredibly useful information. And I think something else that would be really useful to the audience is understanding how they could help you know what what are your biggest needs right now what are the things that you see as most critical and you know how can how can people lend a hand well we we have a we're opening a financing round so it's a it's a it's a nice time to be um that, that's a nice lead question, Nicole. Um, so we have a, a financing round that is opening up. We, we've just, be, because we just achieved this performance threshold for BMW, it allows us to talk about um, some contracting that allows people who want to underwrite our business and, and think about investment. It, we're at an inflection point of having reduced a, a certain type of uh, technical risk. So, um, you know, when, when investors are looking at early stage or early growth or late growth companies, NFW is an early growth category company. We've established product market fit. We actually, we have contracting now with, um, with partners that can manufacture and have infrastructure that can manufacture and be our partners in manufacturing. You can think of NFW's scaling model as a, is is kind of analogous to how companies like Coca-Cola serve two billion servings of Coca-Cola products around the world each day, um, but they don't own all of the bottling equipment and they don't own all of the um, distribution centers. They actually leverage that. They they have their intellectual property leverages the infrastructure of others. And so NFW's at this moment where we're able to to show these relationships between. The customers like BMW and and you know very very large consumer electronics partners and things like that, um, and and shoe brands, fashion brands, luxury brands, and then we're able to connect the dots back to a supply chain that is ready to run our technology, able to run our technology because how our technology was designed was to implement very capital efficiently and very cost effectively. Um, and leverage basically an IP position on infrastructure that's installed around the world. So um, love, it, it, you know, my, my Luke Haver Halls at naturalfiberwelding.com. Um, or, or of course, please reach out to Christian. 
um, who can give you details on the capital raise. We, we have some great partners that have joined and are on the cap already. And, um, you know, finding those partners that can help not only bring in capital, but who have connections around the world. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of brands that already know us, but there's a lot more brands in the world that should know us. And so there are people on this call that, you know, um, some of the dollars that they're thinking about investing were originally probably um, those dollars were made by a fashion company or made by a footwear company or made by a family who deeply understands manufacturing. Um, and so those are the kind of partners that are um, just beyond capital to scale. Um, wonderful partners to have because our team has a lot to learn. Our team is looking for those kinds of um, money plus sorts of partnerships where people can add value to their investment because they know, you know, they've got the right network or they have the right experiences um, that we can leverage and learn from. I think that's great. And I think partnership and solutions that require, um, you know, it's not operating in a vacuum. And, and I think that's something that's so important in this industry, as well as so many others that, you know, being in a silo alone is never what scales. And, um, right. you know, Christian, I know that that is something that is deeply um, embedded in your thought process is solution oriented and really bringing people together. Do you, do you want to spend some time talking about that? Yeah, um, before that, um, I would like to um, give it to Jörg again, uh, because he he has some valid comments on. Uh, I mean, I was just thinking that what what connects, um, you know, Luke's words with kind of our approach in general is the importance of networks and building the right connections. That's true to both your your clients, investors, as well as uh, other stakeholders uh, that you're involved with. And uh, so it's really uh, the, 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 the grid or the, the operating system that makes everything work is really how you're tied into relevant uh, networks and, and connections of stakeholders. Whilst this uh, may seem obvious, uh, I think all of no uh, us have uh, gotten to know um, experiences, places where connections are much, made much more easily. Nicole and and, and many others I've met uh, uh, in, in in places like like Davos, where you know there's just a, a high potential network of of people high quality, and it's uh, much easier to build uh, the right connections. And and this what is something that uh, we'd like to. Uh, uh, to recreate on a smaller scale with a solutions focus uh, during an event that we are putting together on September 15th, um, uh, PDIE group uh, together with Sublime Communications and, and various other partners and, uh, right before Climate Week. And uh, Christian can elaborate a bit more on uh, the nature of the event, what we're trying to achieve and uh, what we're trying to build as a result. Yeah, great. So <laughs> uh, the power of ecosystems, uh, we could also call it. And um, the, uh, the E in PDIE also stands for, for ecosystem. And uh, from the very beginning, uh, this was uh, our utmost intention actually to, to build this kind of collaborative uh, ecosystem where uh, people can really find uh, what what they need and not only what they need but uh, can also give back uh, to the ecosystem and uh, we have something which we know from nature but uh, very often uh, humans uh, believe that we we are superior or we are outside of of nature yeah and um i the the event uh, in New York is 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 one of these examples. Uh, we were sitting together in Davos in January this year. Uh, I met also Luke uh, the first time in person in in Davos, and 
Nico and actually uh, the the reason I I got to know him was that I I visited the Earthshot Prize in Boston. After that, I came back to New York, and there was a big event which was organized by a lovely group called uh, Women and Climate, and uh, I met uh, one of uh, Luke's. Uh, um, assistants or uh, employees called Jennifer and and then we talked and I I, I immediately found uh, this fascinating and I had been looking for these kind of solutions where uh, people really try to not recycle plastic or do do something in this regards but really produce something which is uh, based on uh, bio-based and natural uh, materials so the the event uh, came out of a conversation I had with uh, Nicole back in January, and I was introducing to her uh, the future lunch series, which we which we are running. Uh, we we bring together opinion leaders in a small circle, uh, up to fifteen people, and we have different topics like the future of work, the future of education, the future of AI. Uh, the future of um, mobility was the last one we did. And in each of these events, uh, we we make sure that we get uh, different standpoints and different outstanding innovators and uh, sometimes policymakers and uh, opinion leaders as well. And our event in New York uh, should be an intimate uh, half day where we start with uh, with a networking lunch with inspirational speeches. Uh, we have uh, a number of uh, famous people also joining. Um, I cannot reveal all the names yet, but uh, one thing which is very interesting is we are talking about the oil-based economy. And uh, I should be careful not, not to say it in a, in a too negative way but uh, we have uh, princess rima from saudi arabia uh, joining us uh, she is the first female ambassador to the us from saudi arabia and uh, we also have um, capacities like uh, augusto lopez claros uh, he's a chairman of the global governance forum and then uh, we have a lot of our earthshot prize nominees and uh, we have uh, hopefully the two winners, which we have nominated, um, Vaitea Kowan uh, from, from Enapta and Talal Hassan from 44.01. And uh, some of our past nominees and some of our future nominees, uh, like NFW, Luke Haverhals. Uh, yeah, and uh, the event has five different, five different topics. Um, Sustainable cities. The the city is um, the human habitat, and the human habitat is one of the reasons why we are in, tr in trouble. Uh, Eighty percent of greenhouse gas emissions are actually emitted in the large cities of the world, uh, as as well as eighty percent of the waste is also uh, generated in the cities. So we have we have waste. We have. Uh, energy we we need to produce for the cities and um, everything can be contained in the city uh, perspective so we start with this topic and then we have uh, food and agriculture we have energy transition uh, we have decarbonization and we will have a special focus on methane because uh, methane is is still a little bit uh, underrated and uh, we have to develop rapidly solutions because uh, the permafrost is melting and <clears throat> we have a lot of um, constraints now uh, regarding methane. Uh, then <clears throat> we have uh, nature capital and biodiversity. And um, yeah, so in each of these uh, sessions, we bring together a mix. Uh, there could be uh, somebody from the investor side uh, a solution provider, a thought leader, <clears throat> and we will learn a lot. And one of the, the most important aspects of this event <clears throat> will be to really bring people together in an intimate um, circumstance and let people make, uh, build relationships and uh, build relationships which, which last. 
So that's, and we, before and after the event, uh, we know exactly who will be present at the event and we can actually facilitate uh, the different uh, relationships which will then last. And uh, one of the questions which Nicole asked was how to get involved. And I mean, um, there are different players <clears throat> in the ecosystem and <clears throat> the most important players are the ones who work on solutions. Uh, we would be uh, the kind of the, the hub and the ecosystem builder. Uh, so we would actually put together the different players. Uh, then we have the ones who can provide capital and the ones who provide capital have to be relying on, on experts and uh, have to be uh, cautious in how to uh, apply their capital. And then uh, if, if they trust uh, people like us, for example, and we can help them to select, then uh, we can really accelerate uh, to, to bring solutions to the table and to solve this um, crisis, which uh, some people believe it's irreversible, <clears throat> but every step uh, towards um, <clears throat> Supporting these solutions will actually uh, reverse <clears throat> our uh, dramatic uh, decline, and uh, that's that's what we really want to do. And we hope that uh, some people listening here uh, could also uh, join us for. Uh, in it's it's actually one day before <clears throat> the climate week starts in on the fifteenth of uh, September this year. And yeah, so that that's it will be a terrific event. Yes, and we'll definitely be inviting everybody from um, the Davos Worldwide Network to partake. Um, you know, we really want to be an inclusive group and really bring together. Again, it's about bringing together the smartest solutions alongside the capital that is so desperately needed to implement these great solutions. Um, and I guess, why don't we talk about, are there any trends? Are there things that you're seeing going on that, you know, things that, that <clears throat> we should note? Yeah, so maybe maybe I can I can chip into this. Um, in the beginning of this year, and and this is always um, if I mean during the pandemic it was uh, always uh, <clears throat> online and digital. But if you go to Davos, you can somehow uh, feel a little bit the pulse. And there were some new uh, vocabularies uh, introduced uh, in Davos in the in January this year, and. One of it was uh, biodiversity. So not only talking about the climate crisis, but talking about the biodiversity crisis and also coming up with, um, now we have carbon credits already and the markets, uh, there, there's some controversial discussions about this, um, but uh, now we also have uh, biodiversity credits coming up as, as something new and uh, the terminology of natural ca capital or nature capital. Uh, this is something new. And <clears throat> yeah, of course, in each of the different um, segments uh, which we are addressing, uh, there are trends. And one maybe mega trend is uh, regenerative, the, the term regeneration. So that uh, before we said sustainable, uh, but instead of only being sustainable, uh, we need to regenerate and we need to go towards a regenerative future. And uh, NFW is a, is a perfect example of uh, uh, how we could go into a re regenerative future. I don't know, uh, maybe Jörg, you have something to add in, in the area of energy or something like this? Well, what I'm thinking about is the, the material world. I mean, there's a, an increasing number of deep tech funds because uh, I think not only 
are there more innovations in that area, but also more of a need? So in order to, uh, to change uh, the world uh, to be more sustainable, um, you know, we need to change the world of things, uh, the material world as well. Whilst uh, software products are certainly important and now with the wave of AI, um, that's uh, certainly one trend and uh, helps uh, make impro efficiency improvements. But on the other hand, we definitely need to change the material world as well. And there's one company Kristen and I have worked with called Carbon Mobile. Um, they are known for their materials innovation. They, uh, um, they, they are replacing plastics based on uh, a carbon fiber uh, material innovation. And um, so, you know, and, and to Luke's products, uh, of course, uh, as well. So I think that that's a trend I, I see. It's generally more difficult from uh, an entrepreneur's perspective to raise funds for a material-based product rather than a software product. But uh, nevertheless, uh, it's, it's a, a definite need. And, and I would say that, that capital is moving into that direction as well. And fortunately, more and more patient capital is available as well in order to support uh, those innovations. I think a, a really important point, though, to the difference between hard tech and materials and software, whereas software, it can grow very quickly. Of course, it gets obsolete very quickly, and its impact um, is very temporal. Um, you know, we've seen how trillions of dollars worth of gross margins changed. Oh, you're going in and out a little bit, Luke. All I was saying was hard tech is, is one of these things where when you have the right Moore's law underneath of your idea, it doesn't go away quickly um, like software can. So it's, it's a really important point that Yorgi is, is making is um, the permanence of the impact. To be purpose-driven is to be thinking on long time scales, not just very short time scales. And, and there are some very important um, gross margins through time sort of thinking that um, is really important. I'm sure that there's many people in the audience who understand like if, if you come from a manufacturing per perspective, the ability to change the world, the material world, in a very long-term way is a very important key feature, I think, of um, people who understand, again, going to say, Can you say that one more time, Luke? Sorry, we lost you. I said, I said generally speaking, software has a hard time solving the toxic plastic waste in the environment problem. So that, that requires a certain kind of um, Moore's law of manufacturing type thinking. Well, certainly um, software AI can improve the, the scaling of hardware driven solutions. So I think it's really also about the mix, but that the, I mean, I can see also more and more pension funds uh, moving into that direction because they are, they're realizing that this kind of change is needed as well. Perfect. I, I see we're hitting up on our time, but I think, you know, really just summing it up, um, you know, the importance of coming together as networks and really bringing the right minds together so that we can think about things holistically. And as Christian said so well, we can't all be experts in everything. So it's about getting this collaborate, really collaborative thinking coming from industry experts. And so that, that network is so important. And then, you know, Luke, the, kind of work you're doing is is certainly beyond important. And um, every time I see a plastic bottle, it, it kills me. And then when you think about how many other things that we wear, that we use, so 
creating solutions that are making these changes couldn't be more important. So, um, you know, I hope lots of people get behind that. So thank you. So if I may just add one, one more thing, since unfortunately we couldn't take questions from the audience. So if you would like to find out more about both uh, our work at PDIE and the event on September 15th, just uh, feel free to go our, to our website, pdiegroup.com, uh, where you will find uh, additional information and also our contact information. And I will also make sure that um, people are able to sync up. Since we've talked about connectivity so much, I will, I will make sure that everyone can connect. <laughs> Great. <clears throat> yeah, one wonderful panel. Thanks, thanks so much, uh, Nicole, for arranging it. And uh, thanks for everybody who was listening. And uh, yeah, I can go back to bed and <laughs> Luke can continue <laughs> his journey. So great. Thank you very, very much, everybody. Thank you.